name is Howard Wallman. I live in Merle's Inlet, South Carolina. I joined the Navy while I was at City College, New York, in 1942. They told me I could finish my semester class. In January 43, I went into the Navy, went into boot camp, then to navigation school in Sampson, New York. Towards the end of the session in, in the navigation school, an officer came in, wanted volunteers for a mission, under 25 years of age, unmarried, top 10% of the navigation class. You'd be going overseas and not staying for years like other fellas. Six months of patrol, and you'd get a 30-day leave, either Australia or United States. If you did not go to the United States on your 30-day leave, the next time around, you will go to the United States. What is it about? We asked. He said, that's all I can tell you. You'll need a psychiatric examination, I'll tell you. We'll go there today, right now. I volunteered. We're marching to the psychiatrist. Do you realize the significance of the danger of what you're doing? I says, no, they didn't tell us anything, except they get a six month patrol and a 30 day leave. He says, now these men, told the officer, have to be informed what they're doing. They have to know the danger of what they're doing for me to properly give them a psychiatric examination. Everything is held up, they tell the base commander, and you hear a loud, booming voice, who is the fifth columnist on my base? holding up this war effort. And this psychiatrist was shaking long before that officer came to see him, by his bounding voice. And then come a big, big man. You holding up the war effort with big eyes sticking at him? They don't know what, they're not gonna know at this point. They'll know eventually, but not at this point. Okay, they all pass. He didn't talk to anybody, he just passed everybody. 26 men. What was it? The PT school took us over to Melville, Rhode Island, a hidden base. Everybody in town thought it was a defense plant. Gates around the place with Marine guards. Then the land falls away, and then they hut, Quonset huts down by the water. Magnificent camouflage from the land and from the sea. We used to meet girls in town sometimes. We follow you with our boats, and then your boats disappear. Where, where, where do you guys go? Both from land and sea, it was camouflaged beautifully. Just prior to graduating the PT school, we had maneuvers with destroyers from Boston. We met them out in the Atlantic. The code was they were Japanese ships, supposedly. And we were, if we atta were attacking them, we flashed the floodlights on them. That means they didn't see us at that point. If they saw us first, they flashed it on us, which means we were gone. Storm and thralls that night. And there was a problem getting back to Narragansett Bay. And I said at one point, I thought I saw a star there. And we're in this position. I think we should go this area. I hope the hell you're right. Because I'm listening to you. And I see the destroyers from Boston are following us. If you're wrong, you can bet your rear end you're going to be in trouble. I'm not telling the destroyers to follow us. We got a low draft on a PT boat. They have it. Luckily, I was correct. Four o'clock in the morning, he sat down and wrote a report about me. Next day, they said, you're going to stay here as an instructor in navigation. This is not me. How could I stay here and instruct the next those men? We had men that came back from the Pacific, men that were on the patrol that took MacArthur out of the Philippines, Corregidor, when he was trapped there, he and his family, en route down to Australia, some of the boats broke down. They had to transfer MacArthur's artwork and his precious things from one boat to another, and men have to be left behind in the Japanese lines. Some of them escaped and came back, and they were working there as instructors. I said, you expect me to stay next to people like that? No, I'm not going to be an instructor here. Well, get somebody as good as you to take your place, otherwise you're staying. That's very easy for me. One of the fellows got engaged to a girl, Fall River, there. I said to him, fellow from Virginia, you want to stay here? Absolutely. Take my place as an instructor. Oh, thank you. What can I do for you? Nothing. Just take my place. Got to California. We're going out to the Pacific. 
They put us up in the barracks. They said, you're waiting for a troop transport to be filled, and you'll be the last. Your 24 fellows will be the last down there. A day or two, maybe, at the most. Three o'clock in the morning, they wake us up. It's almost finished. They're going to leave today. There's a breakfast made for you and go on board. We went on board and got to New Guinea, Milne Bay, New Guinea. Thousands of soldiers got off the ship, and there's 24 men are staying on the ship. Captain says, nobody knows where the PT base is. I cannot stay here too long. I'm out in the middle of Milne Bay with this big ship. The Jap planes will come down here, and I won't be here. I got to get back to California and take people back here. If, you don't find, if they don't find the PT base by tonight, you guys are going into the Army. I'm getting out under cover of darkness before the Japs trip and blow me out of the water. Sure enough, they put us in the Army. <laughs> he left. About 2 o'clock in the morning, they wake us up. You PT fellas, wake up. Your boats are here for you. Get on a PT boat. Where the hell's the base? Nobody knew it. You're right near you here. We were wondering what that idiot staying out there in the middle of the day with that big ship. The Japs will blow him out of the water. He was staying because they couldn't find you where to put us. That's why they put us in the Army. They said, you know, and the next morning, you're not even supposed to be here. What are you talking about? The record shows here when you graduate the PT School in Rhode Island to go to Princeton University on the V-12 program. But forget about it. Forget about it. We've got a navigator shut in the legs on the 110. You're going to take his place. We're going to take you up to Carolina Island tomorrow. Take his place. We're in Carolina Island operating for a while. PTs always operated in twos. Earlier in the war, the Japs were not aware of this. And they did, contrary to the laws of the sea, when men were in the water, they turned around and killed them instead of leaving them. The more they did that, the more they were losing ships. They never realized there was a second PT there, and the other one torpedoed them. Eventually, they knew if you didn't see the second one, keep going. Whatever you're doing, don't stop. Ground patrol. Um, near uh, in New Britain, there, big Japanese base there, Albingi Harbor. One night, you operate every other night. You slept one night, you went out one night. Sometimes the patrols are so far, far out, the 3,000 gallons of gasoline didn't get you back. So what they did is strap 50-gallon drums on the deck on the way out, and as you use them, you put them into the tank and threw the drums overboard. Get you, has get enough gasoline to come back. If you open a um, carburetor, or what you call it, on a PT boat at high speed, it's like a faucet of water running through. They used aviation gasoline, 3,000 gallons. Uh, on patrol there that night, January 26, 1944, about 1 a.m., right outside our Blinky Harbor, there was a destroyer. We couldn't even see him get in the position. And I called the captain, come in the chart room here and go over his charts with me. Every time we were here, they were there. He was there, they were there. These fellows have some kind of electrical thing or something to know where we are. He says, what are you dreaming up these things? What are you talking about? You listen to those crazy futuristic things? I'm telling you, how would they know so much that they're moving? And I think they're moving to Albingi Harbor, the big Japanese harbor. Followed it down, followed it down. He said, where are they now? Where are we now? I said, we're, we're going towards Albingi Harbor. He said, maybe you're right. Let's pull ahead. We pull ahead, we're going ahead. And bingo, out of the fog, there's the destroyer that we were just following right on top of us. They're looking down at us, we're looking up at them. They couldn't get their guns down. We're right under them. So we tried to turn around to get away on the other side to get a torpedo into them. The fog came through. Bam! We went full speed into the other boat. The depth charges were set for 20 feet, because in case you had to run and the sub is, is going to go down, 20 feet explosion. When they hit, one of the two released itself. And 20 feet under, it blew up to 110. That's what I remembered. I woke up in a tent. Where am I? In an army field or hospital. I'm in the Navy. How did I get here? PT boat brought you in here. The Navy knows you're here. They're calling every day. 
We'll call and tell them you're awake now. What do you mean they're calling every day? How long am I here? You're here five days. Anybody tell my family? We don't know who you are. We gave you a dog text in the Navy. How do we tell your family? Maybe the Navy did. In comes some real high-ranking Navy officers. You don't see these guys. I skipped something here. On that night, when you graduate the PT school in Rhode Island and go to the Pacific, you don't get a boat for three weeks. For three weeks, you're an observer with different captains on different boats. School is one thing, practical experience is something else. And you took an observer for the night. He goes on, let's go to sleep the next day, and the next night go on observer somebody else. Lieutenant Garner comes aboard as an observer. Captain introduces him. He's Howard's our navigator. Lieutenant Garner's our observer tonight. I hope you're a good navigator, Howard. Don't put us in Tokyo Harbor tomorrow. Get us right back here. I just got married, left my bride in the States. I go over to the captain and I say, do you know he's married? I do. How's he riding with us? Have an uncle like his. You do anything you want in the Navy. Forget regulations. Really? Do you know him? I know him. You know him too. I know his uncle? What are you talking about? Who's the vice president? God, John Nancy Garner is his uncle? That's why he's riding with us even though he's married. That's why those high officials were there. They told him his nephew was dead in Washington. He just, just got out there. How could he be dead? Get out there and get me some first-hand information. Our communication board isn't as great as we have communications today. Today. They come, over, they come over to the bed. We're processing you for the Bronze Star Medal for saving the engineer. Tell us exactly how you saved him. I just want to know what you're talking about. By the way, we've got two engineers on board. Which one did I save? Don't you give us any questions. We will give you the questions, and you will answer our questions. I remember those words over 60 years ago. All I asked them was, oh, I saved you. Where was Lieutenant Garner the last time you saw him? <laughs> they mentioned his name. I knew why they were there. They carried me back to the Navy. I was paralyzed. And I told you, I, for a month or so, they carried me down to the water, and I could walk by myself. They said, you're unfit to ride the boats. This is a stupid remark. Of course, I can't walk. How could I be fit for the boats? And you shouldn't have been here to begin with, so we're sending you back to Princeton. That's where you should have been. Come out here after you have your commission and your degree. The rest of the war I spent at Princeton. At the end of the war, they gave a proposition. If you were going for theology or medicine or dentistry, certain education, go to room so-and-so. The others go to that room. They told those fellows, the end of this semester, we will stop paying your tuition. They told us, we're going to continue paying your tuition. Graduation, you'll get your commission. Give us two years in the fleet and seven years in the reserve, it will be even. Give you 10 days to talk it over with your families and let us know what you're doing. I was going with this girl and her father said, you're going to have the same regulations as before? What do you mean? Can't get married till you have your commission? And oh yeah, all those things remain in force. You don't need them. While you were away, they made a GI Bill of Rights. You can go to college without giving up nine years. What kind of nine years? Two years. Two years and then seven years in reserve. One weekend a month, you're going to have to give them, and two weeks in the summer for seven years. That's nine years. I didn't take the proposition. I didn't marry the girl either. <laughs> I kept in touch with some of the fellows that took the proposition. One that stands out in mind, Ed Rice from Pahokee, Florida, near Lake Okeechobee. Big, tall drink of a guy. And one day he calls me. Meantime, I got married. Moved out to Long Island. He got a call from him. Hello, how I'm in New York City. Where? Statley Hilton Hotel. God, you're right across from Penn Station. Hold it a minute. Let me go in the kitchen and get a schedule on Long Island Railroad. In 20 minutes, there's a train. Walk across the street, go down to the Long Island level, and, and I'll meet you at the, at the station. Go to Hewlett. How will I meet you there? I got a pink convertible Cadillac. What? No, let's not talk about it. You'll miss the train. He comes down in uniform. It's long past the two years. I said, what are you doing in uniform? Oh, I like the life. I stayed on. What did your father do with the stock I told you, my father told you to buy? Well, we're at Princeton to get a letter one day from his father to buy this land in, in uh, Arizona, was it? Yeah. $25 an acre. My father says they're selling land. They don't even know it. There's no deeds to it. There's a desert there. 
I'm trying to feed a family. You'll tell me to buy land in the desert. Forget about it. I said, how many acres? He didn't buy any acres. Oh, that was a big mistake. God. I got $3 million. I got, I got a little land left to sell. Ed, you got $3 million. No wonder you like the Navy. That's nothing. Why do you say $3 million is nothing? My father has $28 million. He has a load of land to sell. They call it Scottsdale now. God, you didn't tell me that. Well, it wasn't that. How could I tell you? So less and less of him after a while. I went to Florida, saw him there. I never went to Lake Okeechobee before. <laughs> never heard of it until I met him in school. And uh, two weeks later, I was in uniform again. But not the Navy. I had a crazy English professor at City College. Every Saturday, you took a civil service exam. Federal, state, city. How many people filed? Where'd you come out? That's how you got your English mark. One day he said, the test of tests is here. This will count more than any test of the year. This test comes up once in four years. What's the test? New York City Police Department. They expect about 50,000 people to file for 1,200 positions. There's no passing mark. The 1,200 person is a passing mark. How do they get to such an odd figure, 1,200? The police are cattle 300 a year, so four years is 1,200. And every four years they have the test. 62,000 filed. I came out 328. I said to my father, I need money to go to Delahanty. Because that was a gym that trained the fire and police department. It seems everybody that took high on the physical went through there. He says, you're out of your mind. I'm trying to feed the family. Your professor didn't tell you you have to go to the gym. He went to the metal part only. I'm not giving you any money. My mother gave me the money. I came out uh, 326 on the final test. They called me down for an appointment. And they got to know us. We were there so much from all these civil service exams we were taking. And while we were coming down, just refusing the exam. And he said, you're here again. I said, I told your manager who to see at City College to stop all this nonsense. You only see us on city exams. We're on state and federal lists, too. But I don't want the job. He said, I got a technical point. Anytime you came here, I listened to you. You cannot carry a gun till you're 21. You're going to refuse this job till you're 21. You're 19 now. The list lasts for four years. You'll be 21 in those four years. I got news for you. I joined the Navy. I'm leaving in eight days. Good luck for you in the Navy. When you come back, tell me you don't want the job. I'm out on the PT boats in the Pacific. My father sends me a letter from the New York Police Department. We appointed you in absentia on September 29th. That was my 21st birthday. Advise your rank in the Navy so we know what to do with the pension. I said to Skip, I got to go back to New York. They made me a cop. He reads the letter. The only way I'll send you back, I'll cycle you. If I cycle you, they won't write. I'm just kidding you, I said, for God's sakes. My father says, you got out of the Navy in the middle of March. If you got out in Fe no, February. If you got out a few weeks before, you could have gotten just back in school in time. What are you going to do until September? I'm going to see about this police job. I got a couple of years already in there. You don't become a cop for six months. Those are 20, 30 year jobs. I'll not give you a penny for uniforms or guns. Don't play any games with me. In those days, you paid for your own guns and own uniforms. I went down. They told me, you'll lend you all the money you need. No interest. Longest time you want. What's the longest time? Five years. I'd take it. I figured September, I'll give them everything back. I got out of the academy in the middle of August. I said, my father, I'm not going to go back to school. I'm going to go on the street. There's something. Maybe one time in my life to get this experience on the street. I'll go back in February. Just after Thanksgiving, there's a notice on the precinct wall. Those wanting to transfer the motorcycle are mounted. Put in form so-and-so. Geez, while I'm here, I learn motorcycles. Put in the form. Telex machines all over the city just before Christmas. I'm transferred to the Motorcycle Academy. So I thought, you're never going to get back to school. First it was September. Now it's February. Now it's next September. I stayed on the motorcycles for... Uh, Short time. Second time I got hurt. My wife came to the hospital. I did not know you in those crazy PT boat days. You got two children now. I don't want an inspector's funeral at the house. If you die in the line of duty, a thousand cops come to the house. They call it an inspector's funeral. So you make up your mind. Is it the department or your marriage? So I quit. 
and I went to something very foreign. I went to manufacturing fake fur coats. Little store with a number of people. 1958, start going bigger and bigger. And I admired a certain building on 30th Street in Manhattan between 7th and 8th and Avenue. That was the real fur district. I was making fake furs in the real fur district. It's a magnificent building with artwork outside. All it needs is a good steam blasting. Some of the floors inside had marble floors. And somebody at one lunch sometime in the luncheonette there introduced me to the real estate agent. He said, why is that building for sale so long? It's a magnificent building. Because it's a skin dealer's building. Seven floors for skin dealers today is too big. There are not that many real furriers around anymore. So who says it has to be sold as a skin building? It can be used for anything. People in Chicago just coincidentally are asking me, reduced it $35,000. To what? To one sixty-five. One sixty-five. that building? God. Everybody said, what are you looking at? What are you, look, what are you going to do with seven floors? Six months later, I bought it against everybody's advice. Best thing I ever did. Eventually, I had 110 people work on those seven floors. And along came PETA, Women's Organization to Save Animals, and destroyed the business. Destroyed the real fur business, too. Throwing paint on the mink coats, throwing paint on the fake furs. I went to Washington twice to speak to them. You're not saving animals. Minks are brought up like chickens on ranches. What about the tigers and leopards? You're throwing it on the minks, too. I saw my competitors all going bankrupt, going clean. One way or the other, they were going out of business. Second trip I came back from Washington, my wife says, what are you going to do? I says, nothing to do. I can't keep 110 people going. Fortunately, real estate around the country from 1958 to 1992 went through the sky. Somebody offered me 15 times for the building when I paid for it. I closed the business. I was sorry to do it. They worked for me for years, but eventually they were going bankrupt. The PT board had two offices, and they had like a little stateroom. Next to that was the men's crew. Twelve men, eleven men, on the boat permanently. But they put so much equipment on there and so much guns, they were glad to have visitors as long as they knew how to use a gun. But they just were the visitor for the night. The boat had four torpedoes, two depth charges, smoke screen, 40 millimeter on the rear, 37 millimeter in the front, and 50 caliber machine guns. And then they added more guns as the time went, because they were getting caught coming back in the daylight with the, with the planes. Unfortunately, in one instance, our own planes were shooting at us. It wasn't my boat, another boat. Made a lot of problems in the Navy. A doctor was aboard. Doctor's not supposed to be riding on the PT boat. But somehow the base commander gave him permission to go on patrol with the men that night. They spread the American flag across the men, say, across the deck. The planes kept shooting at them. They killed the doctor. Kennedy's boat, the 109, four months before we went down, Japanese destroyer cut him in half. Miraculously, only one man died. Miraculous. I was on the 37 millimeter on the bow when we went to action. The captain and the uh, exec would be in the cockpit, or one would stand toward the back where the 40 millimeter was. Earlier, we had the four torpedo tubes to shoot the torpedoes out. But when they went out, they made a flash. And the Japs saw the flash, were shooting into the flash. So they took all the tubes off and they put the airplane, airplane type racks. The rack, you just pull the bar, and the torpedo went over the side. Quiet, no flash, no noise, nothing. And the rest of the water continued with torpedo racks on the boat. After a while, when the Navy started getting control of the Pacific again, they transferred a lot of their transportation on barges. Big, fast-going barges. Shamefully, our Navy had very poor charts of the Pacific. 
as a naval power, it's very shameful that we had it. That's why you'll notice all your sea battles are way out at sea. Battle of Carl Sea, Battle of Midway. They didn't figure out big ships to go. The PTs, they call them expendables. They were expendable. Cheap to make, low drafts. If they lose them, they lose them. And they were carrying on a good part of the war. More hours in actual combat with the enemy than any ship in the fleet. More hours of actual combat with the enemy than any ship in the fleet. For its size, 80 foot, 80 tons of fighting fury, they called it. For its size, most heavily armed ship in the fleet. Each had a nickname besides a number. The 110 was Hero Hero's Headache. That was our nickname across the tail of the boat. If you, on high speed, don't fall off the boat. It's not hitting water, it's hitting cement. You'll be finished. Time to turn around and get you dead before you, they saw you. It's like cement. You're going over a mile a minute in the water. Matter of fact, we did such damage with their barges. Barge patrols are going on every night. Every once in a while, you'll get a surprise. They're not bringing down supplies. They're bringing down soldiers. And you're going along for a strafing, and suddenly all the guns come at you across the thing of their barge shooting at you. And you come back with the boat hitting so many places. Gotta go into repair for a day or two to close up the holes. When we did damage on their, on their barge patrol, they switched to putting roads along the New Guinea coastline going down, bringing their supplies down by trucks at night. And you'd see them come down the hills and the lights, etc. Uh, what's his name? Lieutenant Al Young from Long Island here. He had a nice article in the, our magazine. We have a magazine that comes out twice a year. But an article, I was not aware of that even happening until I read this article two months ago because I was in the hospital at that time. They took the 40 millimeter off his boat and put a gigantic searchlight on. He stood offshore with a gigantic searchlight. Two PTs were in closer to land. All dark, quiet, and we saw those headlights. He said, they saw the headlights coming down from the trucks down the mountain side to the water and over. He put a spotlight at them, and the boats inside would fire at them. So they cut off their barges, they cut off their trucking. The Japs really had a hard time there. Very uh, uh, ingenious, ingenious idea of his squadron commander, Al Young, told me, had that idea, put the searchlight on there, light up the whole place for the boats to shoot at. Always in two. No, always in two. Never alone. That was a mistake the Japs made at the beginning, and that's why they're losing so many ships. Trying to kill, turning around, killing the men in the water, and the other boat would torpedo them. But never, sometimes three, very rare. But two, never less than two. Battle stations, which is continuous once you make contact. You didn't make contact every night. When you made the contact, battle stations, and were firing, firing those guns would be smaller, uh, the barges, mainly. If we had the bigger stuff, the only thing was the torpedo. Because you got wooden ships against, what do they call that there? Wooden ships with iron men or something. Or the Knights of the Sea. Years ago, there were knights coming down from the castles. This was the modern-day knights of the sea. That was their banners and flags. They have that nature. Under fire, to us it was coming. To others it wasn't. We always, anybody wanted to come aboard, we were always glad to have them. We had too many guns. We didn't have the men to man those guns. Marines particularly, go get a letter from your commander, and the letter must state, that you were knowledgeable, that you're going under fire, not just taking a ride on a PT boat. To the proper letter. What do you operate? I'm good at the 37 millimeter. Fine, take the 37 millimeter. We get under fire, and they're not manning the guns. They're digging into the wood. Screaming at them, man your gun, man your gun. After it's over, 
What the hell's the matter with you guys? We're taught to dig in when fire starts. Well, he could dig in a wooden boat. What are you digging in? The only thing we took you for is to man the gun. We told you that. You said you know how to run it. Our training is to dig in when fire starts. So we can't take Marines to get somebody else then. What a good, the gun's unmanned then. Better off you, Howard, had your own gun. You gave your gun away to them. They took a 50 caliber instead. A machine gun, I gave them my gun. Because ordinarily I took the 37 millimeter. But that was their training. We couldn't say anything about their training. I couldn't train them for one night. Some commanding officer told them they couldn't have a re They're going under fire. They can't have the uh, permission. But they're not going for a boat ride. Going, they had a state in their letter. That he knows they're going under fire. Quartermaster is a navigator in the Navy. Okay, now what does a quartermaster do? Charge the courses, does the navigation on the boat. Matter of fact, when I went to Princeton, they took that away from you. Everybody was one rank. You had chiefs there losing their ranks. Spring, late spring of 44. Spring of 44. At that point, big assembly of sailors, different ranks. You're all OCs. So take the ranks off your uniform. You're all going to get $50 a month. Two weeks later, as a future officer, it may be proper you doing laundry, so we're going to have your laundry done for you, so we're going to take it out of the $50. <laughs> Some of these chiefs said, we never informed of this. That's a big reduction for me. I was a chief petty officer. Was, you were told you're going to, be to, uh, to an officer candidate school. Well, they told me I'm going to Princeton. And for the purpose of what? My education, I'll get my commission with my degree. Okay, that's the regulations. Now you're not a chief. You're an OC. You're an officer candidate. And that's what we pay officer candidates, $50 a month. You might go up for it in the future. Don't be so mad. They were mad. They had a big cut, some of those chiefs. First time... I was really frightened. I don't know if I was firing the gun even. And I says, this is a stupid position you gave me. I'm standing here like this. Well, nothing to protect me. I'm standing firing your gun. Guys in trenches in the army, got a trench or he got something. On the 40 millimeter, he's got a big steel plate in front of him. The 50 gallon, the 50 gallon caliber guns, don't look at that, Howard. That's a plywood around it. Don't, that's not steel. He's got plywood in front of him. I haven't even got plywood for him. He's standing here with this. Yeah. And the first time I was frightened, I didn't wasn't firing the gun, they tell me. I was standing there, frozen in a sense. You're eventually able to stay and do your job. PT boat is 80 foot long, made by the Elko Boat Company in New Jersey, who previously made yachts, racing yachts. They were the finest and used them in the Pacific mainly. The Elko, the, uh, the uh, Higgins Boat Company in Louisiana, theirs was like a tugboat. It didn't have the sleek and the speed, etc. They used them in the Mediterranean mainly. Over there was a different type of war for PTs. Most of the boats were Elkos. They used in the Pacific was for the purpose they were made. Speed, in and out, Throw the torpedoes and get out of there. It's a certain kind of wood, it's a form of plywood, wooden decks, wooden sides. It's a, it's a uh, not a plywood like people use on a house or something, it's, it's, but it's plywood, they tell me. The president of Elko, on one occasion, was out there. And uh, they were getting chased by the Japs. The Japs discovered them. Boats were going full speed. A rough sea. They go out of the water at times, they told me the guys on that boat. Out of the water, pound, when it came down. Speed. And he's telling them, slow these boats down. We're going to crack the keel. I make these boats. They can't do this. He was screaming. They said, the hell with you? Because we got these chaps on the back of us. He was screaming, that they're going to break the keel. Break the keel and, and, and uh, get caught by them. 
And when he got back to the uh, base, he told the commander, I build these things. I never knew it could do that. I was sure they'd break the keel. That ocean was so rough, we were banging away. He surprised himself. He learned by being out there. Purple Heart I got right away. The Brunt Star on my discharge papers said, uh, incomplete investigation. Something like that. I read my discharge papers would say something of that nature. Two weeks later, I was in the police academy. I got into the police department on patrol later on in September. Never gave thought of it. Uh, oh, it's over 30 years later. Congressman Ray McGrath, we were at a party with some friends of ours. He said something about how PT boats, they were talking about Kennedy. He said, Howard went with Kennedy. He says he was on the 110. Patrol together sometimes. Really? Let me introduce him. Bring him over, introduce him to me. So it's Congressman McGrath, it's Howard Warman. You guys all got a lot of medals there. I said, no speaking of that, I got issued a medal, but never issued. What are you talking about? I got the bronze star medal for saving the engineer when the boat blew up. But I really never got it now you're talking about. What do you mean you never got it? Since World War II, you never got it? I never pursued it. I just got busy with other things. Oh, that's wrong. Let me handle this for you. About 10 days later, he calls me from Wa This is Ray McGrath in Washington. How are you? I'm fine. You met me a couple of weeks ago. Yes, I remember you, of course. I'm holding a bronze star medal here. I never saw one before close up. It's a good looking medal, but it don't belong to me, it belongs to you. How the hell in 10 days did you get that? If it's a, how long is it, 39, 40 years almost, they didn't give it to me, because I'm your congressman. I'm working for you. Where can I present this? I know right away what he's looking for, big audience of his constituents. I said, well, you want somebody out in Long Island, I'm sure. Well, naturally, figure out where. My wife says, what do, you, what do you think I should have him come? Come to our temple. To all his constituents, right there. Wow, great, yeah. I call this uh, appointment secretary. I said, you know, I'm talking about the temple. I better talk to them first. No, no, we'll handle everything. Don't you talk, we'll talk to them. Well, he's coming down one Friday night. And the president knows about it. Congressional leader knows about it. The audience don't. I said, did you hear from him? He said, no. I don't know if he can get here. I don't know if planes from Washington are going this afternoon. It's snowing. Service starts. He's not there. The president says, I'll give you an empty box and make out that. Don't you do anything like that. Nobody knows he's supposed to be here. What are you doing? If somebody has to see it, I'm going to show him an empty box. No, no, just, nobody knows he's coming. Nobody knows I'm getting this. Half the service is over. He comes in, and they bring him up on the dais. And the leader says, as you all know, Congressman McGrath. He's coming here to award one of our con uh, congregants. But I'll let the congressman talk about it. He stopped talking. Congressman held it up to the audience. This medal was earned 40 years and one night ago tonight. The Navy got lost in administration, brought to my attention. I had brought to him. But I let Howard Woman come up here. Come up to the, take the microphone, tell the people what it is. I told him it was earned 40 years ago when the boat blew up. I saved the, the engineer. I never learned who that engineer was until 58 years later. Coincidentally, a small world, Lieutenant Garner's sister, the, president, the vice president's nephew that died that night, his sister made it possible. We have a magazine comes out twice a year, PT organization. She bought a small space in there 58 years later. Contrary to Navy records, I understand everybody did not die on the 110 boat. I understand there are some survivors. Anybody reading this article knows a survivor, give him my name and address. I'd like to get more information on my brother, Lieutenant Garner, who was on board that night. I'm getting calls all over the United States from the fellas now. As I know what you're calling about, I read the article there. I'm going to write to her. 
And I did, and I told her I knew very little about your brother. I knew he just got married. I know he's a nephew of the vice president. I told her something she did not know. Two boats, one each night, closed the mufflers, and went into Albingi Harbor in case they got to shore and the Japs didn't get them. And they're calling out the men's names. Squadron commander heard it and he says, absolute suicide. I lost a 109 four months ago. I lost a 110 now. You're closing your mufflers, go into a Japanese harbor silently, and then screaming out names? Those people here like we here, they're not deaf people. Before I lose another boat, cancel every mission like that. So I regret I can't tell you anything about your brother other than that. She writes back to me, I owe you an apology. I gave your name and address away without your permission to the engineer who told me he was saved by the navigator. I read that, I started calling Kansas information. 20 minutes later, I got the right person. Who did you give that to? I'm waiting 58 years. You can't believe the response I got from that, my article. If I took a bigger article, I have to move out of my house to accommodate the mail. To answer your question, I gotta dig through so much mail. Well, do that, please. I told the story why I wanted it. I got the medal, I don't know why I got it for. And she said, I'll, I'll go through, dig through it and find the person I gave it to. Don't write to me again. Here's my phone number, reverse the charge. Call me when you get it. About four or five days later, a man calls me and says, does the name Mike Giala mean anything to you? As you asked me your name, Mike, I couldn't give it to you. You just gave it to me? I know just who you are. They gave me the Brunt Star Medal for saving you. How did I save you? You were yelling at everybody on the boat. My yelling at everybody on the boat doesn't save you. When the boat blew, the boat blew, I'm in the water, some idiot throws me a May West. How can I put a May West on if I'm in the water? Go ahead. Go ahead what? Keep talking. About what? I'm trying to find out how I saved you. That's all he remembers. What'd you do with your life? Navy put me out on 70%. Oh, the worse than I did. I live in Revere, Massachusetts. Where's that? South of Boston. You ever get married? I got six children and 12 grandchildren. Wow, that disability didn't hurt you at all. What'd you do your whole life? I came home and started handling plumbing tools. I got into the plumbers union. Matter of fact, 15 years ago, I got a pension from them. Well, you got two pensions now. And you travel all over the country visiting your children and grandchildren. No. No? Your family problems? Or I don't want to be personal. No, no family problems. I own a six-story house, six-family house. Four of my tenants are my children. The other two live a quarter of a mile away. You got six children and 12 grandchildren a quarter of a mile from you? Unheard of in this country. Sit down and write a book. I'll get it published for you. I was telling one of my managers, tell him not to write the book. He used to go all over the country opening up stores for Caldor and for Kmart. Revere, Massachusetts, generations of Italian families, what, they live there forever, the children live there and the grandchildren. So he doesn't write a book, they won't get it published. That's the way it is up there. <laughs> Periodically we're calling each other. Well, I said, you're wasting your time. Go up to Battleship Cove in Massachusetts. PT Boats is a, a museum there with battleships and PT Boats. Sit on the boat, take advantage. If you were on the PT boat, you and your family can go on the boat. Visitors, they cut glass sides in to look at. Sit on the boat with him, instead of all these calls you're doing, and then see what happens. Good idea, June. We meet one weekend, Friday night, we're at the hotel, we're talking, go to sleep. Saturday morning, we go to the boat, sitting on there, go to lunch, come back, sitting there, there all afternoon. Sunday morning, go back to the boat, what the hell do you question me the whole week? What the hell's going on here the whole weekend? I'm trying to find out how I saved you. I told you. I didn't throw you the, the, uh, the Bay West. They gave me the medal for saving you. As long as you save me, the hell how you got the medal, you got to saving me. But how did I save you, Mike? Why do you take offense when I question you? I've been questioning him too much, I guess, the whole weekend. He blew up Sunday afternoon. So I don't know how I saved him yet. I think it's the most brilliant thing he did. Island by island, particularly Tarawa, we lost so many men. And that's when Truman called his naval staff up there. <clears throat> island by island, look what we lost here. They said we're going to lose a half a million men before we take over Japan, if we're going to continue island by island. And that, that meeting 
caused Harry Truman to say, let's drop the bomb. I don't want to lose a high half a million men. The Japs didn't react immediately to it, so he immediately dropped the second bomb. Didn't give time to think. And that saved a half a million men. Because Tarara, they were defending themselves that way and dug in on the islands. They had to go each island like that. The admirals told him it would be a half a million men lost when he asked to answer to his question. 